was born in 1928 in uh, Forest Gate, East And then my father, he was a, ter I might as well tell you, he was a terrible, terrible gambler. And he gambled all his life, terrible. We also owned a pub in Bishopsgate called the Primrose. And he had an account with Watney's. You had to bowl your beer from Watney's. And then eventually we moved to Soho in 1937. 37, 38. So I was nine years old, nine and a half, when we moved to Soho. And my grandmother was living in Walder House, and she found a flat for us, number 15, and we moved in. This is the most famous water house now. Yeah, this is the water house buildings. Darn it, I'm mad. Who walks in when I walk out? And who gives you that? Well, what happened when we moved in, obviously, we settled in nicely there, and there were no heating. So you had to have a coal fire. And I remember the coal man, his name was Arthur Murray and Fred Murray. They had a coal shop in St Anne's Court. The coalman, Charlie, he used to come round to Water Street and carry up 73 stairs a sack of coal. And above where we lived, on the floor, there was a coal bunker and he would shoot the coal into the bunker. And they were more or less my fondest memories of Charlie Murray coming round with the coal. And my mother said to him, do you think you could get my son, my older son, a job to help you deliver coal? And he said, well, I'll have a word with my back, and they had a word, and they got him to deliver half hundred weight sacks. Little boy, they used to give him on a trolley, and he used to go to Maddox Street. And he loved going there because he delivered it to the prostitutes. And when he delivered the coal, they always gave him two shillings. This is called, this is called Flaxman Court and it leads down to where the garage is on your left, the Sean Kilburn's little passageway and as you can see here these are all gas lamps. Now they're all obviously electric but they're all gas lamps where a man would come round on a bicycle with a long stick, push up the, the clip at the side and light the mantle and it would light up and he'd come round in the morning early to switch them off. I was very fortunate because the first school I went to was St Anne's in Dean Street which is now the synagogue of St Anne's School. And all my friends that I made lived in Richmond buildings. He, there was an Italian boy, um, his name was Johnny Soleri, and there was Jackie Coon, who had a, an Irish mother and a Chinese father, and they were my best friends. And another boy who had a cafe in Walder Street. His name was Dino Cappuccini. They owned the film cafe. And we got very, very friendly. And we used to play in Richmond buildings. That was our playground. From St Anne's School, after I left there, I went to St Patrick's School in Soho, which is in Great Chapel Street, I think that's the name of it. You know the playgrounds on the roof. Still there, still there. And I probably spent some of the happiest days of my life 
and I loved going to school because the first one in the morning was the one batted first on the roof. But I loved my school, I loved it dearly. And my main memory of the school was the priest from St. Patrick's Church came round and he used, we used to come in, we all stood up, good morning, and it's imprinted on my mind. Will all other denominations, other than Roman Catholic, please leave the class? And I had to go and stand in the cloakroom on my own. I was the only Jewish boy in the whole school. And believe me, it, it didn't feel embarrassing at the time, but for some unknown reason, the bonding of our friendship became greater. I mean, the Italians, the Gibraltars, we had Spanish, Chinese, every denomination. And wonderful times, wonderful times. Behind me is Let's Garage and Let's Garage was a garage in those days where you parked your car over and, uh, when you went out and the cars used to come up Windmill Street and they'd go into Let's to try and park their car and on a Friday night, it was a very busy night and Saturday night and they couldn't get a place to park the car so the kids, me uh, Basil Wiesan used to do it, he was very good at it. As the car came into the garage, all the cars had a running board. So you jump on the running board, and the man would open the window, and he would say, Garage, sir, I can take you to one. So he says, Stand on the running board, go down to the end of Brewer Street, turn left into Walder Street, and take him to Shaw and Kilburn's garage. And when you got there, when you brought the car in, the man you took there, gave you a little tip, and I believe in that garage they might have given you threepence or sixpence for bringing the car around, so you got a double. And then, if they were full up, you go down to a garage in Poland Street, which wasn't very far away, and you take them there. I think they gave you more money there, and the driver also gave you a tip. You got more money at that one. morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note. On the day the war broke out, we were all at home, and I remember it vividly, listening to the radio. Stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. We are now at war with Germany. War has been declared. I remembered it. Everybody was sad. We, we didn't, we couldn't really take it in, I couldn't. Then war, total war, came to London. The target was everything and everybody. Because we were with Shaw and Kilburns, they had one of the finest air raid shelters. And the tenants of Walder House were allowed to use it. So my mother, she was the most phenomenal lady, she would get all the bedding and go down, and you're supposed to take it all back up at night and make beds, camp beds, whatever, and all the family used to go down there to sleep. And my mum, brave lady, she used to go up to the flat and stay there. And one night, uh, a bomb dropped on Richmond buildings and all the windows blew out. And she never, never stirred air. Phenomenal. And during that period, I used to go down the undergrounds 
at Leicester Square in Piccadilly looking at all these people where they turned the electricity off and they actually laid in the, in the, on the railway line and some of them laid at the side and lots of kids got up to try and get sweets on the black market and go down and try and sell them. That was another little racket. <laughs> remember all the shops. We're now coming up to Port the Mews and Port the Mews is where Mr Cattle, RN Cattle and Sons Limited, Portland Works. Now they were woodworkers and they sold all the wood and you could come round and have wood cut and a very very wonderful man Mr Cattle and he was there for many 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 years and we used to come round here and this was our cricket pitch during the war and we're going to walk down there and we'll show you where we played cricket during the war. This is where we used to play cricket. You would get some paint and you paint the wicket on the, on the wall with white paint. The three stumps and the bowels. And believe it or not, there is some of the paint left from the original wicket. At the bottom here you can see the white paint of the three stumps. And you would stand here, the bowler would be at the other end, and you hit the ball tennis ball by the way, not, and you'd hit it. If you've got it above the first floor there, you've got a four. And if you've got it above the second floor, with a good shot, you get a six. This was Mr. Knopp, K-N-O-double-P, Mr. Knopp the barber. And lots of people went to Mr. Knopp. The gentleman would go and have hot towels and a shower. And um, people, uh, I think we went there a couple of times when we went to the haircut, Mr. Knopp there. Uh, in Dean Street, there was uh, a barber shop, it was called Knopp, K-N-O-double-P. And next door to the barber, there was a chewing gum machine. I think there was two. One was XY chewing gum and I think the other one was PK. And it was a halfpenny. So we used to stand near the machine, wait for a gentleman to come along, put your hand in the pocket, excuse me sir, have you got two halfpennies for a penny? And you would hope he only had one halfpenny. And if he only had one, he wouldn't take your penny and say, all right, keep it. If he had two, and he gave you the two, he might not take the penny from you. So you're standing by the machine, making lots of pennies and halfpennies. During the war, one of the worst bombs was an oil bomb going back, which dropped in Old Compton Street. And it smothered all the buildings in oil. It was terrible, really, really bad. And I used to go onto the roof and collect all the shrapnel from the aircraft guns from Hyde Park and the incendiary bombs that, with, the, with the top piece where they burnt out. We had, a, we had a flat asphalt roof and all it did was left an imprint where it burnt. Unfortunately I gave away all that shrapnel, we should have kept it. The incendiary bombs are the ones that damaged St Anne's Church. When the war ended in 1945, it was before my 17th birthday, so I'd just gone 16. Maurice Jolson was a friend of mine, his father owned this grocery shop. And we got together, and we went round there, and we got an old tea urn, and we filled it up with water. And Jolson had some orange cordial, and there was no plastic in those days, 
There were cardboard cups reinforced with wax. We got some of those and we got a borough from Derrick Street and we ruled the borough down to Trafalgar Square where all the GIs and everybody were celebrating and we sold orange juice in a cup with the water from the urn to to cap to try and get some pocket money. Money was very, very tight. We're standing in the precincts of St Anne's Church and above my head there is a memorial. Uh, one of them was Sammy Walters and Sammy Walters lived in Walder House at number five Walder House. Um, Jackie Grossman, I think I remember him but not as well as my other friends because they went to a different school. They all went to Peter Street School. One of the boys, I don't remember which one, he was an air gunner and the other one, I think he was, he was uh, in the Navy and he was on a ship, I think, that got torpedoed. I got married in 1952. I met my wife when she was 16 and I married her when she was 19. And, um, we had the flat in Maidaval. After the lighting business went pear-shaped, in the end, somebody said, Harvey, they need someone in Berwick Street Market. A chap called Billy Betts would like to see you. So I went and saw him and he gave me a job. And I wound up running the whole thing from Brewer Street, where I took you where the gate is, where Master Nostins. We had a ware warehouses there and we sold Nest Cafe, which was on, um, you couldn't get it, but if you were on the square and you shook hands with somebody, he'd say, I'll see and get you 20 cases. So we sold everything we sold at cut price. Razor blades, Wilkinson's, uh, Gillette's, Cabbage chocolate, anything we could get a hold of, we sold it. And we had five stalls. And one of them was in my name. You spoke to only have one stall. Come to Walker's Court now. In 1965, Rosen the Baker, he had a pastry shop here. And a friend of mine knew about, it was coming up, we're gonna be empty. So he negotiated and asked me if I'd like to turn it into a sandwich bar. So. In 1965, uh, it became a sandwich bar. It was called Harvey's Sandwich Bar. As we walk along here, the building opposite me was taken over by a chap who ran a striptease club there when I had my sandwich bar. It was a striptease club. And when the boys from the market came in, the girls used to come in for a tea or a coffee or something. And they, some of them were wearing a fur coat. Maybe not a proper fur coat, but a fur coat. And the boys in the market say, go on, darling, give us a flash. And they'd open the coat and they'd have nothing on. Give us a flash. My lingerie was especially made for me to pose as queen in the fashion parade. In the later days here, obviously a lot of sex shops opened up and a lot of bookshops. And in the bookshops, they were selling books and photographs which really were a bit over the top and what the owner used to do he would put a chap as a, called him the manager but they said he was the man in the chair and the man in the chair if the police raided the bookshop then that chap would be in trouble so obviously they he would be sent to prison probably may get three months so the owner would be out of it. So they were caught, that was called the man in the chair. In those days, unfortunately, there was a lot of problem with the police uh, at Savile Row. And what they would do, there was one police officer there, and one of his men would bring the bookshop 
in the morning and say at two o'clock this afternoon there's going to be a raid on your shop. So the chap in the chair would contact what I call a runner and one of the chaps would come along with a big canvas bag and he would put in that bag all the stuff that they shouldn't be selling, photographs and books. They'd zip the bag up and they used to rent uh, part of a building in Bridal Lane off of Burr Street and put the bag up in one of the, on one of the floors there and leave it there to the all clear. And unfortunately, it was a bad period at that time because the police inspector would then arrange a meeting with the owner over in North or South Aldley Street where they'd meet up in the pub and they would be passed a brown paper bag and in the brown bag would be some money. Don't you know that's very dangerous? What? Leaving stuff like that lying about. Supposing you or me were to break our leg on that. You'd be very pleased with yourself, I suppose. That would depend whether it was your leg or mine. Can't tempt you, I suppose. Oranges. Very nice today. Good for the feet. I'm pleased to tell you all that that inspector, I think he went to live in Spain, but he's dead now. And I I'm, I'm, I'm hope now it's all cleaned up and that villainy doesn't go on anymore. Good night, sweetheart. All my prayers are for you. Good night, sweetheart. I'll be watching all you. Tears and the parting may make us fall on. But with the dawn, a new day is born. So I'll say good night, sweetheart. Sleep will banish sorrow. Good night, sweetheart. Till we meet tomorrow. Dreams and fold you. Oh, hear them, dear. I'll hold you. So good night, sweetheart.